Alright, got them going. Uh, fade out nice and slow, right? One of these days I'll get better at that. Alright, uh, a couple things today, right? We're going to get started on trees, our new data structure. Um, there's a lot of trees and we're not going to cover all of them, but we'll come back to search trees and uh, trees get interesting. Uh, this will be a, a big topic in 350 if you continue on in data structures and algorithms analysis. So we kind of Introduce the topic, we don't go super deep on it. Uh, so that should be a welcome change of pace, I hope. Um, and then we need to talk about the next project, which I think we said would be due on 3.7. So if you wanna get it done before break, great. If you wanna get it done after break, great, up to you. But hopefully that three week period there, because it includes break, um, you know, however you wanna work your schedule should be fine. Um, and then next week we'll do midterm review on Tuesday and then the midterm on Thursday. I have no plans to actually meet in person on Thursday. I don't want to sit and watch you take a test. That sounds terribly boring. Um, and for the midterm, I'll just open it up on Thursday at 2 p.m. And as long as you have it in by 2 p.m. on 3.7, we're cool. So anytime you want to take it, great. It's designed so that you can take it in an hour 15 if I really wanted to watch people take it. So it's not long. It's half quiz style questions and then three long answer style programming questions. And by long answer, like, do this thing. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a uh, last, uh, last year's midterm, because I have to rewrite it every time. And not that you folks would do it, but other people put test material out on sketchy websites, um, and then we have to rewrite, which is fine. Like, it's probably a good thing to rewrite them anyway, because, um, sure. Um, and then I think we're good then, right? Okay, cool. So let me fire up uh, my charm here. Now, trees are actually really interesting in that this becomes the, the first, uh, I don't know, more advanced data structure that we're going to look at. Um, it, it does a whole lot more stuff, which is fun. So let's take a look at, oh, I don't need tips here. This is week seven. Wow, week seven. Trees. All right. So what's interesting about trees is that it is a recursively defined structure. So the way that a tree is designed is that it's made up of other trees, and those trees are made up of other trees, and those trees are made up of other trees, and those trees are made up of other trees, as many trees as we want to have. So it starts to get a little bit silly here. Uh, but the idea, and now when we say tree, um, you sort of think of like a tree outside, right? You got a trunk here, and then you go out and you have some branches, right? And then some of these branches have branches, and those branches have branches, and those branches have branches, and those branches have branches, have branches, have branches. And uh, like, I don't know, as big as a tree is going to grow, right? They, they have branches. So usually you imagine a tree like this. The downside is usually when we think about trees and we visualize them in code, we do it upside down. Just, I don't know why. That's kind of what we do. So we'll say the tree starts here, and then it has branches going down, and each of these here is another tree with some number of branches. And you get all sorts of interesting terminology around these. So you can have some branches, some can just have no branches, and that's fine. They've just an empty tree. So this is a tree, this is a tree, this is a tree, this is a tree, here's another tree here, right? So each item in the tree is another tree. So you get this tree of trees of trees of trees of trees of trees. So you can see why it's defined recursively. And that knowing recursion is going to help understand and work with trees because doing it without recursion is going to be a real big pain in the butt because that's just difficult for us to do. So the idea with a tree then is we write a class for tree is uh, have our init here. A tree can have an item. Right? It might be none. It might not. So it will store its own item. And then it's going to have um, self.children here is a list. In this list of children, we'll have more trees, right? So we can have a, you know, add child, given an item. And to add a child, we'll take our self.children, and we're going to append a tree given the item. Right, so we'll make another tree with that item, and now I have a child. Right? So to get our children out is a little bit funky here. Um, and this this is where it starts to get a little awkward as we go, because which one do I want? Well, maybe we can go by index. That, that's an option here. So maybe get child, get child. Uh, you need the index, right? 
and then we can return my self.children at the index. Sure. So you can add children, you can get children, and we can work with trees. Now, the reason why this is such a cool data structure, though, is think about things like our file system. Right? Do you know how many folders there are total on your computer? No, I mean, you've got the C drives. That's sort of our, our root here, right? C drive is like the root tree. So root is our term for the, the start of a tree. And that's the root of the tree. Again, we're upside down because, I don't know, we've always drawn it like that. Um, and the book draws it like that. And I don't know, I learned to draw it like that. <laughs> and I feel like an old person. Um, but there's a bunch of folders. Each one of these folders is essentially another tree. So my Python 3.11 folder is its own tree. So we'd say the root of this Python 3.11 folder is this folder here, right? It has a bunch of folders and it has files. So the file system's a little bit more complex. You, you might imagine files as like trees without children. Maybe it's a nice way to think about that. So if it's a tree without a child, it's just the item. If it's a folder, it's the name of the folder and a bunch of items, right? There's stuff inside of here. Okay, no more folders. What's inside of here? There's some more folders. What's inside of here? I don't know. Look at that. We found the, the C code. This is super interesting how Python actually works and like translates stuff into C. Um, but honestly, it's beyond me. Um, oh, I have to ban someone. Thank you for offering me a promotion to, to work on my channel here. You can go away. Where's the ban button? Ban. That's so fun. All right. So working with the tree, we can model these sorts of structures that we don't necessarily know how tall they're going to be, how deep they're going to be. Again, with lists, we, we could make lists as long as we wanted here, but it's one dimensional. And you can put a list of lists, and we can have two dimensions here. But again, it's a very fixed sort of structure. Like, how would you model, and you know, tree is a pretty easy thing for this, like a family tree. Your parents, and your parents' parents, and your parents' parents' parents, and your parents' 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 parents', parents, parents, parents and like as far up as you wanted to go, you don't really model that in a two-dimensional structure, right? It doesn't doesn't really fit in rows and columns. So not all data fits in rows and columns. So tree is a structure that gives us a hierarchy, right? We've got this level, and then you have the children level, and the children's children level, and the children. And so whatever levels of things you wanted to store, to classify, or to group together, you can work with trees. So it gives us another way of working with data, which is fun. So we can make a tree. Um, let's say we have. What do we want to make a tree for? How about animals? Because animals are fun, right? So we can make a tree. So this will be our mammal. Mammals? There's two M's there, right? Mammals is a tree. And it's just mammals, right? That's our classification for mammals. And I'm going to Google this because I have no idea. Mammals. Mammalia hierarchy? Can't. Thank you for knowing how to spell. Thank you. Classifications of mammals. Oh man, here we go. So kingdom, phylum, class. So this is class mammalia. So we could have the kingdom animalia, the phylum chordata. Sure, we'll say all these in because that sounds like fun, right? So we'll go up a little higher. So this is our kingdom is going to be a tree of animalia. You guys all take biology? Does any of this ring any bells? No? I thought everyone took biology. Like high school biology? As well, that was a while ago, right? Okay, that's okay. We can forget all of that. That's okay. So then to add the phylum, chordata, sure, we'll say kingdom.addchild, chordata. Once I've added it, now I can go and get that tree back out, right? So I can say, hey, my chordata is my kingdom, get child of zero. I know that there's an index zero because I just added it myself, right? This is, uh, works out pretty well. And then I can take chordata and I can add a child. Add child, and I can add. Now, the type of head's not working here because it doesn't know what we're getting back out. Right? It's a little confused because it knows it gave me back something here. Um, so the type of head's not always perfect, but we can add child, and we want to add mammalia. Mammalia. Right? And then we can grab that variable then equals dot 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 get child zero. Did I misspell that? Mammal. Oh, it's probably because it's not English. That's probably why that's, uh, I think that's misspelled. Does it suggest something else? Rename to, nope, it doesn't know. Okay, that's fine. All right, and then 
inside of groups of mammalia. What do we want here? We've got to have some classification, right? Okay, so here's some Rodentia, Chiroptera, oh, they're bats, and Shrews, or however you say that other word. Interesting. So these are the breakup of Mammalia. So probably if we wanted to go uh, Carnivoria. Right? Oh, look at that cute little raccoon, that little carnivore. Raccoons are carnivores? They eat garbage. Right? That's can't, okay, sure. We'll look up carniv carnivoria. We'll add that one in. So then our mammalia, dot add child. We can add carnivoria. And again, yeah, we can add lots of different children here. So we can add rodentia. We'll add a bunch of these here. Why not? And then we can mammalia, dot add child, rodentia. And I wonder what all these things are. None of these look familiar at all. Primates. Okay, I can do primates. That one I know what it is. Apparently it's been a while since I took biology too. A child. All right, so we can have any number of children here. It's just a list. We're just going to throw as many as we want here. Now let's work on carnivoria, right? Because we wanted to try and get down. Eventually we get down to cats. Because cats are the superior species. So that should be at index zero then. So our carnivoria should be my mammalia. Get child at zero, right? Because that was the first thing we added. Should be at index zero. And then in Carnivoria, let's see if we have got a breakdown here. What do we have? Where's cat? Cat like cats? Delidae is the family. Okay, so this will be a kingdom, phylum, class, order, family. So this will be the cat family here. It's added next. So Carnivoria, add child. Yeah, cats. Probably add dogs too. Some people like dogs. I like dogs. I don't like taking care of dogs. I should specify. Um, nothing against dogs. They're wonderful creatures. Just caring for them is a hassle. Um, so let's see. So that was cats versus dog. Dogs. They are canidae. Okay. Canines. Right. Carnivoria. Add child. Canidae. All right, and again, inside of that, you can add more dogs, right? So modern dogs, sure. I don't know. They must uh, have their species somewhere in here, but this is probably enough, right? So we'll add a bunch of things. So if we just take a look here in debug mode, this gets kind of fun. Once we add it all, once we add all of them here, uh, let's, and let's print um, kingdom dot item, right? Did I store the item? I never stored the item. Oops. So uh, self.item is the item. Right, we should probably store that value there. My, my mistake. I don't know. Maybe it's never none. I don't know. Could be none. Okay, so we'll pause here. So before we print that one, let's run this in debug. We should open this up here. And see. Of course, my friend. Wow. Someone just donated $50 to the Student Scholarship Fund. That's phenomenal. You are a legend. Thanks for donating to the University of Michigan Dearborn College of Engineering and Computer Science. Uh, I'll get that over to the scholarship fund. That's, thank you so much, my friend. The internet's a crazy place. Thank you. All right, so we see each of these trees here. So our main tree, right, was the kingdom tree, Animalia. It had children. It only had one child. It's another tree here of Cordata. Cordata had another tree of children, which was Mammalia. And Mammalia had three different trees as children, right? Because we added um, carnivoria, we added rodentia, and we added primates. Right? So if we wanted to go through and print every item in the tree, do you think we could do that? Yeah, we probably could, right? So if we wanted to find print tree, where do we, go? Where do we want to start? Probably print our own item. We can print item, uh, self.item, and then what about for child in self.children, we call print child, right? Because that is a tree. Oh, no, uh, so that, uh, no, that's, we want child dot, there we go. We want to re, we want to recursively call print tree, so be child dot print tree. 
right? Which would print itself and then for each of its children, call print again, right? So let's try that. So instead of print item, we'll call kingdom.printtree. Oops, print tree, right? So this should be recursive in nature. So it's gonna start at the, the root here, whatever tree we give it, print itself, and then go for each child and print all the children. Now the order is gonna be a little funny here, right? Because when I find a child, I'm gonna go print that child. So it will trigger printing the child and then it will look for any of its children. So it's gonna go down one generation first. Now we don't have lots of different children of children of children of children here. Uh, so it probably won't be too weird. But if we added in some other classes here and other, other things, right? This idea that we had, let's, uh, let's start the new page, right? We had uh, our kingdom, right? Uh, that's, that's in the wrong spot here. You don't need me to draw, do you? Because that, that will not come out as pretty, right? We have Animalia and the Cordata and Mammalia, then three different ones. So the first one we're going to see is Carnivoria Felidae, and then we'll get Kennedy, and then we'll get Rodentia and Primates. So if you added in, let's add in some more Primates, maybe. How about that? So we'll say Primates, or Rodents. Should we do Rodents? Rodents are cute, right? Rodentia is Mammalia, get child of one. Let's go find some cute Rodents. We want Mammalia. Warrior, this one's mammalian. So Rodentia, what do we have in here? A squirrel. Aw, squirrels. Squirrels are cute. Marmots? All right, we got to add a marmot. So the family of whatever this thing is. Scuridae? Okay, that's all like squirrel type creatures. Tree squirrels, ground squirrels, flying squirrels. Sure. So Rodentia dot add child of Scuridae. And then Scuridae has the Kingdom Found Class Order Family Gene. I don't they add in more levels here. Now I'm confused. I didn't learn that in biology. So then we'll have Scuridae is Rodentia, get child of zero. And then we can add one more child. Of Marmata, because those are cute. All right, then we can print our tree. So the order that we get these things back out is a little funny, right? So we got Animalia first, right? that was our kingdom. I think we expect that one. And then we got Cordata, that was the first child. Cordata's first child is Mammalia. Mammalia's first child is Carnivoria. Then we go to Carnivoria's first child, right? Because the way that our recursion is going, we're going deep, 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 deep. Next level, next level, next level. Then we get Felidae and Canidae. Then we go back to Mammalia's second child, Rodentia. And we get Scuridae and Marmota. And then we get Primates. Right, so this is known as a depth first traversal. So if we're like working through the tree, we're going as deep as we can first. And then we're coming back up. There's other ways to, to work through trees that don't go in this order. Can you think of another way we could do this? If we wanted to, say, print each generation at a time? So I'm going to call this one, this is depth first. We're going, to, we're going to change it up. So what if we wanted to print trees, uh, I don't know, level by level? Is, does level make sense? Like here's one level and then the next, or generation by generation maybe? That might be better. Generation by generation. So instead of calling my function for each child first, I don't want to do that. Right? Because what I want to do is I want each one to print its own and then go to the next one. So to do this, it gets it gets a little tricky here. But the idea is we can use a queue. We can throw everything in a queue and then work through the queue for what we need to do. So we're going to make a queue, which really is just a first in, first out. We can go through a list. I actually need to use the queue structure. Back to my friend, thanks for donating to the Student Scholarship Fund here at the University of Michigan Dearborn College of Engineering and Computer Science. And you just hit a milestone, my friends. Uh, Hector has donated $100 worth of bits through Twitch. Okay. Thank you very much for funding education here because it is way too expensive. Although it does pay me, so I feel like a little hypocritical to say it's too expensive, but um, I don't get paid a lot 
Does that, that make you feel any better? I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I'm not trying to make you feel bad at all. I'm um, just like, the whole system is screwy. But that's okay. We, uh, we can envision new systems, and once you get out into the world, you can enact those changes, right? So it's a little tricky to change the system from being a student. Um, I'll just be honest. Uh, I don't know how well that would work, unless like you all went on general strike. I'm not suggesting it. I'm just putting it out there. Um, I don't know what would even happen. Like, I don't know. Like the, so I'm a part of the lecturer's union, and we've threatened to strike before, and then we get things from the university. They're like, hey, look, we do have money to pay you more. Surprise. But the whole system's messed up, but that's okay. Um, sure. All right, so what we want is a way to store all of these values here we're going to put into our queue. So we need to grab, we're going to print ourselves, and then we're going to put all of our children in a queue, right? And then we can work through that queue and make sure all of those children add their children to the queue and work through those children and add all of them to the queue. And then it, it gets to be this, this uh, larger process here. We're still recursive, but I want to not immediately call my print function for my child because I need to make sure we're working through each item here. So we're gonna have that items queue. Um, let's see. So we're gonna have our items, right? Will be a list. And then we can start adding things to the items here. So we'll take items and we want to append. So the first one is self. And then for every child, we're gonna take our items. We can append child. So now I have myself in the list, and I have all of my children in the list. Then we're going to need a little helper function here, because this one doesn't take any arguments. I can't hand it a list of things to work through, right? So we need a little helper function, so print three generation by generation, that takes self and the, I don't know, the queue, can call it the queue. It really is, a, again, it's a list, but we're just... We're only going to take stuff from the front and, and take stuff out of the back, I guess. Um, probably not the most efficient, but again, we don't. We could do better. We're just being lazy. Does that feel bad now? But that's okay. Right. So we're going to print the tree generation by generation. And actually, this will probably work out um, pretty nicely here. Let's just do this. We'll uh, just make a new list here, and then we'll call print self dot print tree generation by generation given the items here. And we'll take the queue and we're going to append self. Right, so the first thing this will do is add self and then we can go through and add all of our children here. Then we want to start working through the queue, making sure everything gets added. So we don't even need self, do we? Shoot. Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to do this from memory here, and I should be copying off the book. So we want to let's add, our, let's add ourselves to this here. Is that what we want? Give it the items. Because we want to go through, and now if there's something in the queue, we want to work that in the queue. If the queue. Length of Q is greater than zero. We're going to take the first item off and then add the rest. Okay, so we'll take the uh, item, give me my Q dot pop at zero. We're going to take the first thing off the Q, and then for child in item uh, dot get item dot children. Take the queue and we'll append the child. I think this is while. While the length of the queue is not zero. Take the first one off, add all the children to it. Once we've added all the children to it, we can print the item dot oof, item dot item, that's ugly. Um they call current item. That might be better. So if we're not empty, grab the first thing, add all the children in, and then that should get 
right? All the children off of each child, add them to the queue, get all the children off of each child, add them to the queue. And eventually we'll print the, we'll print the odd item. Right, so if, if we look, let's just about draw a, a basic one here. So let's draw, um, this is Animalia. I should just do this with boxes, right? That's probably easier. Um, let's just do text boxes. That's fine. We had Animalia, and then we had Cordata. And then we had um, Mammalia. And then here, then, we had three children, right? We had the, uh, which ones do we add? Carnivoria, Rodentia, and Primates. So Carnivoria, Rodentia, and Primates. And in Carnivoria, we had felines and dogs. They were both that, right? Felines and what's the dog one? Oh, Canidae, C. C for Canidae. And then Rodentia, we had, what do we add here? Scuridae and Marmata. Sure, so Scuridae and Marmata. And we didn't add anything to primates. We can go add more to primates later. So if we're working through and we grab ourself to start, and then we call our recursive function. Actually, I don't even need that. Maybe we don't even need that recursive function. We just do a loop, and we can do a loop. I think that's all it was doing, right? A length of items. I think that was it. So we're going to add our we add ourselves to the list, and we pop it off. And then for every child in our children, we append it to the list. Go through every child, add it, and then when we're done, we print ourselves and we go back to the list. Hey, do we have more items? So our list here then should be Animalia to start. And then it says, okay, go through and grab all your children. So pop yourself off. So Animalia is off, and then we've added Cordata. So now we have Cordata in here. So we'll print Cordata, right? Or get all Cordata's children, pop it off, and add Mammalia. So we have Mammalia in here. When it's working Mammalia then? It grabs it, pops it off, and then for every child of mammalia, it's going to add it to the list here. So our list then is going to grow. We're going to add carnivores, rodents, and primates to the list here. Then it'll print mammalia. Then it'll go through, hey, is the, is the list empty? No, it's not. So it'll grab carnivore, and it's going to add. So carnivore comes out, and it's going to add felines and canines. Right? Then it says, is the list empty? No, let's go to rodents. So rodents will add the S here, right? And add to the child. And then is the Q empty? No, it's not, right? To grab the next one, primates. It'll add, primates has no children, nothing to add. And it'll do felines, canines, and some, whatever that S was, right? And when that one hits, it'll add the M. So this will go level by level by level, right? Using a Q, essentially. So again, top of zero, this is bad, bad. Use a real queue. Sorry. Again, we could fix that later. This is just our, our little example here. So if I wanted to print generation by generation, we should be able to do that as well. So kingdom print generation by generation. So we get animalia, cordata, mammalia, carnivore, rodents, primates, felines, and dogs, canines, scuridae, and marauda. So it's just a different way of working through this. So now this one, because we're using the queue, doesn't actually need the recursive bit here like we did with the other one. We printed our children. So you could do this as well without recursion if we wanted to use a, a queue as also. We could. Or I think um, is this one would be a stack. I think we'd add this as a stack. Because the first child would go on the stack and we work that one and work that one and work that one and work our way back. Um, so you can use those other data structures we looked at to avoid the recursion, but sometimes recursion is just easier, right? Like, you don't have to think too hard about this one. Just print the child. Print the child. Print the child. For every child, print it. Right? So the recursive solution is more straightforward, a little easier to follow, where this Q thing here, this was a little awkward to work through, and I bumbled a little bit, but I think we got there. Right? Eventually, we'll go in and get the right answer here. Why? Is that another space? There. Okay, two spaces to work on it. That's our basic tree. So this is um, also known as an N tree because we don't know how many children there are. There are specific types of trees we're going to look at that fit very specific forms. So the most common tree that we'll look at is a binary tree 
where you have at most two children. Right? Binary. So at most you have the two children there, not n number of children, because uh, binary trees let us do some really cool stuff, and we'll get there eventually. Um, so our search trees are typically binary trees uh, once we get there. So we'll talk a little bit about trees when we build out. Um, a priority queue, we use a binary tree. So we'll, we'll get to those. Um, maps are completely different, which is weird. Um, why, why we jump and then we come back to search trees, but that's okay. Um, so our, our basic trees. So I think that's pretty good for basic trees. We'll talk more on Thursday about trees. I want to make sure we talk about the project to get you started on that. So uh, believe it or not, I actually have that one in here. I just have to hit the publish button because I was like doing stuff during lab and felt really good about it. <laughs> so it's here. Um, so for this one, uh, the self-assessment stuff, um, we had some trouble and you can't upload more than one thing and, and all that. So the idea here is if you just put that in your readme file, life is really easy. Right? So you can come to the rubric, look at each item, score yourself in the readme file that gets generated here for your repos. So there's the readme file and then the main Python file. Right? If, if you just put that in the readme, it's nice and easy, and it gets attached to the repository, and life is good, and I'll see it there. You don't have to worry about making it pretty. You can do all sorts of cool stuff with Markdown. That's how I created this syllabus copy here. This is the README file. It's just Markdown formatting. Um, you can do all sorts of fancy stuff with it, but um, that's all it is. So it doesn't have to look pretty. It doesn't have to be a table. Just, just tell me for each item here. Um, so for this one, we're going to imagine we are the unloading merchandise and delivery company. Sure, why not? We need to load airplanes and trains from containers that have been unloaded from ships. So we're a dock, right? Ships come in, we need to unload them and make sure we're putting the items on trains and planes, okay? The materials from the dock are stacked up to five containers high if they're gonna be sent by train. So, hey, here's a bunch of containers that go for the train, here's a bunch of containers that go for planes. They'll tell us which one's which. When I go unload stuff for trains, I'm gonna go put them in a stack of no more than five containers high because OSHA says that's the size we can get, right? And if they say that's safe enough, we're gonna we'll get exactly that far, right? Uh, materials to be sent by planes are unpacked and placed on an assembly line or a queue, right? Just, just a moving line here. Uh, each item is labeled either a train number or a plane number. So the container tells me, hey, I'm gonna go on train number one or train number two or train number three or train number n, right? Or hey, I'm going on plane number one, plane number two, plane number n, whatever it happened to be here. Okay. Um, for our stacks of items here, we can go five high, and then we need to make another stack behind it. So there's a, a queue here, right? First in, first out of stacks. So we have a queue of stacks, and we're going to add five items, five items, five items, five items, no more than five high. Three high is okay, right? If I run out, if I don't have five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 train items, the last stack will not be five, right? That's okay. It's just however many containers we had is fine. Um, right? This new stack has begun behind the original. So you add another stack, you add it to the queue. Um, items on planes are just on that long assembly line. So because of budget shortages, we only pay one person to load trains and one person to load planes. So um, the trains and planes closer to the dock have a smaller train or plane number. So train number one is the closest. Train number two is next closest. Train number three is next closest. On and on and on and on. Same with planes. Plane number one is the closest. Plane number two is the closest. Plane number three. On and on and on. So for trains, it takes you two minutes times the train number to take that container, put it on your high-low, take it to the train, unload it, and come back. Right? You drive the high-low up, or whatever the I don't. You don't use a high-low for containers. Whatever they use for these containers, sure. They'll go pick it up. Takes two minutes to get there and back. So. A single to get there is one minute times the train number, and then to get back is one minute times the train number. Right? So it's our two minute round trip. Um, for planes, this is much further away because airports have to be further away from the dock because of reasons. So it takes you 10 minutes times the plane number to get to the plane, and planes are spread out a lot further here. So plane number one takes five minutes to get there, five minutes to get back. That's a 10 minute round trip, right? So given the order of items that are unloaded from the ship, we need to write a program to determine the total time it will take to load all the materials. When is each train fully loaded? When, in each, when is each plane fully loaded? So we know when they can take off here. Again, we're not optimizing anything yet. We just need to figure out what this is, and then later we can go and optimize. Well, that's not part of this. But you can imagine once we have a model, 
here, then I can start playing with some numbers and say, well, what if train number three was actually train number one? Is that going to save me time or not? And do all sorts of that fun stuff. But first, we need a way to figure out how long it's going to take. So for input here, um, from the keyboard or a file or, or something here, right? Um, typing it in is fine. Um, that's one option. We got lots of different ways here, but this is the quick way. Right? Instead of having to deal with reading files or getting it from a web service or reading out of a database somewhere, which will just fine. We're going to get... Now, the uh, input here is really funny. This is actually a project I've recycled uh, from Dr. Ellabogan, who is big into the competitive programming space. And in competitive programming, everything comes in on the keyboard. It's, sure, why not? I don't know. Um, they couldn't think of anything better. So input is very specific and output is very specific because it runs through automatic checkers and, and all sorts of fun stuff here. We're not going to do any of that auto checking, but that's okay. So you're going to get four integers, T, P, N, T, and N, P. Sounds silly, but that's the number of trains, the number of planes, number of items for trains, and number of items for planes. So you'll have between 0 and 100, not including 100, trains, 0 and 10 planes, not including 10, and then your number of items here will be less than or equal to the number of trains that you have and number of planes that you have. Could be a zillion. These are infinitely large planes if we really want it, right? Why not? Sure. Um, then the second line is the number of items for each train. So I know how many items should go on each train here. And then the third line is the number of items for each plane. How many items should go on each plane? The fourth line is the train number for each item. So I'll have NT number of items here, each with a train number between 0 and T. Right? So this goes on train number one, this goes on train number two, this goes on train number three. So the input is just what train it's going to get loaded on for that one. And then the last line is the same for planes. So input might look like this. This is the input. So three trains, two planes. Ten items for trains, five items for planes. Here's the trains. Two items for train one, seven items for train two, one item for train three. Planes. Three items for the first plane, two items for the second plane. This is the specific train number for each item that goes on train. So the second train gets an item, second train gets an item, second train gets an item, first train gets an item, third train gets an item. Right? Second train, second train, second train, first train, second train. And then planes. Plane number two, plane number one, plane number one, plane number two, plane number one. What you're going to output is the time at which each train or plane was fully loaded and ready to take off here. So this gets funny, but that's okay. Let's draw it out because that's the easiest thing to do here. Okay. So three trains, right? So we have our trains, one, two, and three, right? This one wants two items. This one wants seven items. This one wants one item. It's bad planning on our part to send one item on a train, but maybe someone else is loading on this train, sure. And we have our planes. We have plane one and plane two. This one wants three items. This one wants two items. Okay. Now we know our trains and our planes. Now we need to unload the dock. Right? So we take these items and we're going to stack them five high at a time. So to start our stack, we're going to have a two, a two, a two, a one, and a three. This stack is full. Now we add behind it, right? Because we're queuing these here. So the next stack that is two, 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 one, two. So these are our train items, right? These are our train items here. That we're going to load up, and this is the front here, because we're going to work it as a queue. First in, first out. Okay? The plane items are pretty simple. They just go on a queue here. So um, two, one, one, two, one, and we're working first in, first out with the, with the plane items. Okay? So now we have our little worker here loading trains, and we have our worker over here loading the planes. Okay, which one do you want to do first, trains or planes? Trains, okay. So a worker goes over here, goes to the front stack, and says, what's on top? Well, this goes to train number three. So at zero minutes here, right, because we need to start the clock here, we're going to walk over to train number three, or drive our high-low over to train number three. How long does it take to get one way with a train? Remember, it's the train number. So this takes three minutes to get there, and then three minutes to get back. So when he gets back now, Six minutes have passed. But when did train number three have its one item? 
how many minutes had passed when it first when it got its one item. Three minutes, right? So in the output, train number three was loaded and ready to go in three minutes. That's where we get the three from. This one's checked. It's done. Three minutes. Okay, we come back. It's been six minutes. Now we grab the next one. We grab number one. So we walk over to train number one. How much time has passed? One more minute, right? So it's seven minutes. We add an item. We come back, and it's eight minutes. That one's done. Grab the next item for train number two. We walk over to train number two. Add an item. It's been eight, so now we're at 10 minutes. We come back, and it's 12 minutes. Grab the next item. 14 minutes. Come back. 16 minutes. Grab the next item. 18 minutes. Come back. 20 minutes. Now the first stack's done. On to the second stack. 20 minutes have passed. Go to train number two. 22 minutes. Come on back. 24 minutes. Here's an item for train number one. We're at 24 minutes. We come over here, load its second item, check it's fully loaded. It's been 25 minutes. So our output here, train one, was fully loaded 25 minutes in. Right? We come back, it's been 26 minutes. We grab this one 28, 30, 32, 34, 36. Train two is fully loaded. We come back, it's been 38 minutes. We don't care though because we're done. This train was loaded 36 minutes in. 36 for the train. Okay? For plane items, right? It's been zero minutes. It takes 10 times the plane number for a round trip. So five times the plane number for a single trip there. So two times five, 10 minutes to get there. 10 minutes to get back has been 20 minutes. 25 minutes, 30 minutes. 35 minutes, 40 minutes. 50 minutes to get the second item there, right? It's fully loaded. We come back, it's been 60 minutes. Take the last item here, 65. That's a six and a five, sure. That train's fully loaded. Our plane's fully loaded, 65 minutes. And again, this is for N trains and planes, up to 100 trains, up to 10 planes. Does that make sense how this flow kind of goes? So what we need to do is have good object-oriented design. We're going to use classes to represent these things, right? There's a bunch of nouns we've talked about. Not every noun needs a class. Right? You, you can go that route. There's nothing, I mean, maybe it's wrong to go that route, but you can. That's a, probably a little over-designing here. But we should have classes to represent things, and classes know about their attributes, right? So, like, train is a pretty good noun, right? Things train knows about itself. How many items it expects to have, and it probably knows how many it currently has, right? They all start off at zero, and you start adding items, sure. And it should also know when it was fully loaded, because that'll make printing this out pretty easy. I can loop through every train and say, hey, when are you fully loaded? Right? Sure. So you could use the classes here. Um, the train calculations being correct and the plane calculations being correct. So you only get 5 out of 15 for being right, which feels a little funny here. But again, it's not really a math class. Not, not this is hard math at all, but, you know, if, if it's mostly there, you get most of the points. Um, and then actually using a queue of stacks and a queue using the correct data structures here for points. Don't just abuse the list like I did just now with our trees. That's bad. We actually want to use a queue and use a stack, right? And use those methods and functions um, that come with them. So it sounds like a lot, but I promise this one's not quite so bad. Uh, this one's usually a lot easier than the recursion project. Um, just a lot of pieces here. Um, just tackle it one piece at a time, right? If you want to tackle trains first, great. If you want to tackle planes first, great. You want to tackle the unloading process, right? How do I get these items into a queue of stacks? Go for it. We got lots of different pieces we can break down here um, and go from there. That make sense? Okay. How's this one feel? Cool. And we've got time, right? I mean, up to you if you want to get it done before break, if you want to get it done after break. Ideally, you get, you take a break, though. That's really good for you to have a break where you don't need to do anything. Because breaks are important. So somewhere in there, I'm assuming you won't work on this for a while. Right? I mean, I don't know how many of you actually spend like half an hour a day working on your projects. I feel like that's not all that productive. You kind of like got to sit down and get into the zone of, of working on it before it makes a whole lot of sense. Um, so uh, there's, there's an interesting, totally unrelated to this, but um, the, the cost of meetings for software engineers and people doing development work and like any sort of mental work and okay, that you have to context switch. You're thinking about the work, you're thinking about the project, you're thinking about what you're doing. And then a meeting happens and you have to shift gears. All that has to come out of your head or you're not really paying attention to the meeting because you're still thinking about the other stuff. 
So every time you have to change gears and context switch, it adds time and cost. Well, essentially cost because it adds time to whatever you're working on. So um, they, they recommend you know tools like Slack and Discord and things. If you get interrupted all the time, it's hard to get into the flow of working on something. Right? Just depends on what you're doing. Because some of these projects, like you want to sit down and work for two hours straight and be like focused. You know what you're working on. You have ideas on what you're trying to code out, and you can sit and work uninterrupted. It's useful here. Uh, so chunks of time. I don't recommend an eight-hour chunk. That's too long. Right? No one needs to sit for eight hours straight doing anything. That's awful. Um, if you like that, great. I mean, if that's your style, go for it. I, I don't mean to tell you you're, you're doing it wrong, but um, like I like to try and get like one-hour blocks in. Like work for an hour on something straight, steady, without getting interrupted, and that works out pretty well. So, all right. Um, so we'll come back on Thursday then, and we'll do more on trees again. Mostly scratching the surface of trees. We're not going super deep on trees. Um, so we looked at the end tree. We'll look at some other versions of trees. The book gets complex. So we're going to start diverging from the book here because he uses subclasses for everything, which is really cool. It's a great example of how subclasses can be great. But then when you look at just that next piece, you're like, well, what is it doing here? Because he uses all these subclass functions. And that, I feel like, makes it a little harder to track what's happening in the specific one we're looking at. So my examples will deviate from his a lot. Hopefully, then seeing it two different ways is useful. Um, I, it's kind of the, the thought there. Um, yeah, win, win, uh, midterm review. I'm going to post the PDF. Um, I'll probably actually post it on 216 so you have time to look at it and come with questions on 221, right? Because we'll meet for lab to do trees and then we can do midterm review after lab. Uh, I can go over the answers to the short answer questions if you want to see them. Um, and then on 223, again, if you'd like to come and have me watch you take the test, let me know. If not, we'll plan not to meet that day. Because literally, you've got up until 3-7 to turn it in. Uh, if you want to get it done and out of the way, great. That's awesome. If you want to wait, it's up to you. Whatever you got to do. I know you have other classes. So I, I try try and be flexible with some of these dates here. Because um, it's like everything happens one week. That makes for a real bad week. Um, so And this week is already bad enough. So that's, you know, we're going there. We'll, we'll try and be a little lighter this week um, and, and figure out what we can do from there. So And then we'll have winter break. We'll come back. Um, we we'll do a, a, most of priority queues. Um, they're relatively quick enough, um, not super complex here, um, that we can get into those. We'll do maps on our own. We don't really do much with the tables and skip lists. It's, it's in there. Search trees, we'll start the basic level of search trees, all the advanced stuff you'll do in 350, um, some basic sorting and selection, and then we'll talk about ethics, which is actually a lot of fun and particularly useful and important to talk about in data science because you can do some really bad things with data if you're not careful. Um, or if you just don't care, but that's a whole other story. I can't fix that. Um, and then our final project will pick up. So 3.7, we'll start project four. The last individual project will be 3.21 or so. And then we'll have from 3.21 on, so a whole month for the final project. Um, and I don't think we, oh yeah, so this one we do need to pair up with partners because uh, you have to do it as part of a team. Three is a little much. I think partners is enough at this level um, to work on that. Um, but that is one of the outcomes. So it's, we do need to pair up with people. Um, so I think we have 12 people enrolled. I just checked. So we should be able to get six pairs. Um, if someone drops and we have to do a trio, you know, I, I'm open to that because I don't want you know, one person to be stuck. But um, that should be the goal. So we'll have a month to work on that final project. And then the last three sessions are totally set aside just to work on that because I know you folks are busy. Um, so. Ideally, by 418, this last meeting, it's done. And you have nothing to worry about for finals for this class. All you have to do is present it and show that it runs and like we did last semester. Just get up and show it. Um, so that's sort of the goal with that one, if we can get there. So ethics will be a little light as well. We'll have time at the end of each of these sessions to work with your partner for the final project. So hopefully in April, you can get that knocked out uh, the first couple weeks of April. And that's the goal. Okay. That's awesome. So if you have anything else, we'll call it a day. Um, thanks to our friends online for donating to the scholarship fund. You folks are phenomenal. That is super cool.